Hey everyone, and thanks for jumping back into the Cryptoverse. Today, we're gonna to talk about Bitcoin, the beauty of mathematics, part 47. If you guys like the content, make sure you subscribe to the channel, give the video a thumbs up, and also check out Into the Cryptoverse Premium at intothecryptoverse.com. Let's go ahead and jump in. So as of June 1st, 2024, the total market cap of the entire cryptocurrency asset class is coming in at approximately 2.528 trillion, with the fair value now at 2.637 trillion, representing a slight undervaluation of 4.14%. The general idea is that the total market cap of the asset class goes through periods of overvaluation and undervaluation because the markets, we go into bubble phases and then we go into sort of you know, depression phases where no one wants to touch crypto. Um, and you can see it really on the chart, right? So the red line represents the fair value and the green, sort of the, the space above the red line represents, you know, full blown bubble territory. The space below the red line represents sort of the, the window for where the, the, the asset class just sort of slowly moves. Everyone's kind of bored. Um, you know, you can often tag the lower green regression trend line as well, especially on some of these wicks uh, that we've seen. And so, I mean, it has really been business as usual for the most part. The main thing that we have seen occur over the last several years is a lot of the, the capital that was allocated into a lot of the altcoin projects from the last cycle. A lot of that capital is actually rotated over to Bitcoin. You know, and if you think about it, where Bitcoin is right now, you know, Bitcoin is at essentially all time highs or, or really close to all time highs. Um, whereas a lot of the other cryptocurrencies are nowhere close, right? I mean, Ethereum is, is somewhat, but it's still not there. Obviously, you have like Cardano and Avalanche and Matic and Polkadot and XRP. I mean, even Solana, it's had a great run. It's still not at all time highs. And that's just kind of the, the way the cycle works at this stage of the cycle. You know, you go through this period where Bitcoin sort of takes over. It takes back a lot of that market share and people keep thinking that the altcoin market is going to catch up. And, you know, theoretically, eventually it probably would. But the whole thing that we've talked about on here for the last two and a half years is that, you know, Bitcoin should reclaim a lot of that market share until we get back to looser monetary policy. Now, we are getting relatively close to lose some monetary policy, but at least by just mostly sticking with Bitcoin for the last two and a half years, even from the peak in 2021, right? If you just stuck with Bitcoin, DCA Bitcoin, and sort of tuned out everything else, you're, you're doing pretty well, right? Yes, there are some altcoins that you would have done better with, but Bitcoin is certainly the easier strategy to go with. And so that's kind of where we are right now. Now, remember, you know, there's not a lot of examples to go off of as it as it pertains to you know rate cuts and whatnot. We only really have one example, and that was last cycle when the Fed cut rates in 2019. You can see we actually went slightly into overvaluation territory, and then we came back down. And then it wasn't until you know about a year later where we actually really went full blown bubble mode, and that wasn't really until QE returned in mass. So you know, I mean, you have to look at at all these prior times and. You can see recently we actually sort of poked above the fair value. Um, right Again, right now we're slightly below it. So anytime you go above the fair value, it, it sort of is worth seeing, okay, well, what happened the last time? So, you know, what happened all the prior times we went above the fair value? So if we go back to the last cycle, you can see that, you know, the first real instance of going above it, we went above it for a while. And then the, the rate cuts, actually, once rate cuts arrived, uh, Bitcoin and the asset class sort of fell back down to earth. Then the money printers turned back on, and then we went into full blown, full, full blown bubble mode. If you look at the cycle before that, once we went overvalued, we didn't really look back, right? So in this case, we did not really look back in 2016, um, or really, actually, it wasn't until 2017. So it wasn't until the post having year. So last cycle, sort of the durable rally that took us into full blown bubble mode did not occur until the very end of the having year, early part of the post having year. Cycle before full-blown bubble mode did not occur until about halfway through the post-having year. Um, cycle before that, uh, kind of similar to the last cycle in the sense that you had sort of this mid-cycle top above the fair value. You then came back down to earth for a while. 
And that was also, by the way, in the uh, the pre-having year and the having year, kind of like the 2019 rally. And then you had full-blown mania in the post-having year. Um, so, I mean, it really does go to show how the cycle generally works and how it how it has historically played out. And I, I honestly, I, I feel like we're at a crossroads, right? I mean, if I, just to speak my mind, I mean, I, I really do feel like we're at a crossroads because on, on one hand, you have a lot of people talking about sort of a left translated cycle peak where the peak occurs this year. And that's possible, right? That's certainly possible. And we've even talked about that outcome. And I, I think that outcome is going to be sort of more so solidified based on what actually happens this summer. Um, so I, I do think it's worthwhile to keep that, that theory in mind, uh, sort of the left translated peak idea where the cycle peak comes, you know, well in advance of what most people are thinking. I think a lot of people, of course, are thinking sometime in 2025. It's funny because I, I mostly hear people say, you know, the first half of 25. And that's also possible. I mean, you could look at last cycle and say that the real peak was in the first half of 2021. But then the other, the counterpoint to all that is that, you know, the, the actual top occurred in, in the second half of 2021. And in 2017, that top was in the second half of 2017. And in 2013, so all prior, the, 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 the peak in 2013 was also in Q4. So literally the last three major market cycle tops occurred in Q4 of the post having year. Um, but it sort of raises the question, well, you know, if the market just stays as manic as it is, and, and we just keep on screaming higher every few months without really taking a break for, you know, for a while, you know, how much longer can it really go on? And that's what brings people into talking about left translated peaks, right? They're, they're more so thinking, well, you know, we've been in full-blown mania since like October. Um, you know, if what, what happens if we just cool off for a few months, like 2013, you can see 2013 also had a top kind of in, in, in April, this time we had this local top in March, what happens if you just cool off and then you get another rally in, in Q4? And then that marks sort of the, the grand finale and then you end up getting a bear market in, in, in 2025 instead of you know what would normally be a bull market. And again, if you're looking at that pattern, I, it, it makes sense to think like that. You don't even have to just look at that cycle. Look at, look at last cycle. You see how we had sort of one rally that topped out in April cool off, and then another top later that year. So if that plays out later this year, then I think you could argue it's it's sort of following potentially that left translated peak. A counterpoint, though, to that would be, you know, if there is some type of intermediate phase, kind of like 2019, once those rate cuts arrive, then the market cools off for a while. Um, and, and back in 2019, it essentially cooled off for six months, and it ended up being nine months because of the pandemic. But if, if it hadn't been a pandemic, you could have argued it just would have been a six month cool off period. So I do wonder, I mean, I, I do think it ultimately comes down to whether, you know, rate cuts usher in sort of the cool off period um, or not. And, and that I think should help, help, you know, help us or give us at least more insight into the nature of the cycle. You know, if it's a left translated peak, um, or just sort of more your normal run-of-the-mill cycle with a top sometime in the post-having year. Honestly, I mean, I, I still lean towards just a normal, you know, let's not overcomplicate it cycle. Um, but I also think it's worthwhile to pay respect to the left translated cycle theory because this is the first time, you know, we've really put in new highs before the halving. I mean, I guess that's not entirely true. If you look at the first cycle, of course, before the first halving, uh, obviously, we're putting in new highs, but I mean, at, you know, every cycle after that, right? Um, and, and in the first cycle, there wasn't really any prior cycle to compare to either. Um, but all the cycles after that, we've we've always put in new highs after the having, not before, until this one. And so that would raise the question: Well, if you can put in a new high before the having, does that mean that you know you get a left translated peak? Again, at this point, you know, a chart like this, when you look at the chart like this. It would suggest, right? It would suggest that this peak is not as manic as the one in 2021 or the one in 2013. Sort of your your Q1, Q2 peaks. It, it would suggest that it's not as manic, even though it feels like it can be sometimes. And the reason why it's not is because the most of this move is just courtesy of the king, Bitcoin. 
And a lot of that move has come from, you know, the spot ETFs and people converting their altcoins into Bitcoin. And that's why we've talked a lot about how do you preserve the Satoshi valuation of your portfolio during post or during pre-having years and even, even part of the having year is that you just stay with mostly Bitcoin. You can speculate on the altcoins if you want. I'm not trying to step on your toes. I know there's money to be made there, but by just sticking with Bitcoin, it you kind of see a majority of those altcoins just sort of bleed back to it until that looser monetary policy arrives. And now the ECB has said, the European Central Bank has said they're going to be likely cutting in June. So that's this month. So, you know, that looser monetary policy might start to finally usher in. Uh, but do remember that last cycle, it, it was it was actually a couple months after the Fed cut rates that that altcoins started to bottom out against Bitcoin durably. It was after the Fed cut rates uh, back in 2019. And so we'll, we'll see when they do that. It doesn't really look that likely for June unless some catastrophic data print comes out this coming week with the labor market. Um, but we will, in fact, see. So I just like to look at this chart because, you know, there, there are instances, of course, where you do sort of go back down to the lower logarithmic regression trend line before the real move begins um, that takes you into full-blown bubble territory. You can see that, that happened last cycle and the cycle before that. You might say, well, it didn't really happen last cycle, but it actually did. The lower value on this was about $100 billion. And if you look at March of 2020, while it doesn't show it on here, um, we actually had a wick down to approximately $100 billion. Um, Maybe I could even uh, uh, pull it up so you could you could see what I'm talking about. But you know, essentially, essentially, if you go back to um, to 2019 when you had the pandemic, right? This drop here. If you look at the low here, this L up here, uh, about 108 billion, and so that's ultimately where it went. And then if you look at 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 2015 um, on this move in August of 2015, that lower bound was about three billion. So if we go look at total market cap. Uh, over here in August 2015, you can see the low was about $3 billion, right? So again, you know, we're just looking at daily closes on this chart, but it doesn't necessarily do it justice as there were wicks down to the lower logarithmic aggression trend line. Again, no no guarantee you go back there, uh, but if you do, it would it would likely represent um, a, a pretty compelling opportunity if it, if it were to arise following, you know, following rate cuts or something. But again, I mean, at this point, we still haven't we still haven't reached those rate cuts. Uh, last cycle, we saw Bitcoin rally until about one month before the first rate cut. Um, so we'll see if it if it wants to mimic that or if it's kind of already in the, the other side of that or not. But again, I, I think we'll figure out a lot of that this summer. Um, and, you know, last summer, last summer was a pretty boring time in the markets. Uh, if you look over here, we kind of, you know, we, we, we faded. We got a bounce in June and then we just faded again. Um, so... Something like that could certainly happen again, uh, but we will have to we'll have to wait and see and and see if it you know if it plays out in a similar manner or not. If you look at if you look at the percent difference between the total market cap and the fair value logarithmic regression trend line, you get a chart that looks like this. And in this case, it sort of shows you how how you'll often sort of poke above the fair value, test the waters for a little bit. You know, the market will say no thanks. You go back down and then you go up. Um, you can see that that happened in two of the last three cycles. Two cycles ago, once we went overvalued, we didn't look back. This cycle, we've gone overvalued, and you can see that we have sort of fallen back in a little bit. So it'll be worthwhile to see. I mean, you know, back in, in 2015, we basically stayed undervalued from January 2015 until May of 2017. So that was essentially two and a half years. We fell undervalued here in June of 2022. So two and a half years would actually put you all the way out at the end of 2024 or early 2025, um, which is funny because 2025 will be the post-having year, which is precisely when all these prior mania phases really kicked off. The last cycle, it really started. It it it, it actually started in Q4 of the um, of the of the having year, but it was basically knocking on the door of the post-having year. So just another chart to take a look at and um, sort of think about how you want to navigate the cycle. Again, I've, I've said for a long time, I think Bitcoin heavy makes more sense than altcoin heavy. I get that people don't like that. And I, I honestly will not talk about it next cycle because I don't think people care. But um, hopefully it has been helpful to you guys. And uh, we'll see, you know, we'll see what the summer brings and, and what opportunities arise. Um, and we'll take it from there. But that's your update.
Uh, the last thing maybe is to overlay the, uh, the summary risk onto the chart. And when you do that, you get something that, that looks like this. So kind of a cool way to sort of visualize the data. But anyways, we'll go ahead and wrap it up there. Thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, and remember, as always, the goal eventually would be to see the total market cap go to 10 trillion, plus or minus a few trillion. And as we go to sleep at night, we cannot help but wonder what's a few trillion dollars among friends. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.